All right, so now we've gotten through most of the meat of the unit. Uh, so we're going to move on to section 5.4 and 5.5 today. 5.4 uh, is, um, again, we're just going to kind of recap the relationship between function and its first derivative and its second derivative, uh, and talking about concavity and maximums and minimums and all that fun stuff. And section 5.5 five is actually infinite limits, which is something we did um, back at the beginning of this semester. Uh, now 5.5 five is the actual section in the book where infinite limits comes up. If you recall, none of the book problems from unit 3 or uh, chapter 3 had anything with infinite limits. Now we'll see those again. So we should already knew how to, know how to do that part. All right. So first, just kind of a recap of the relationship between a function and its derivative, or this is going to be a few recaps of relationships between a function its der and its derivatives. So uh, conditions. Um, if the first derivative is positive at some point A, and the second derivative is positive at that point A, what are, uh, what descriptions can we conclude from the, that information? Well, if the first derivative is positive, we, then we know the function is increasing. Uh, and if the second derivative is positive, then we know the function is concave up. So this is an example of what that might look like if this is our point A. All right, well, what if the first derivative is positive at A, but the second derivative is negative at A? So now, how could we describe what is happening to that function? Well, since the first derivative is positive, the function is still increasing. But since the second derivative is negative, now the function is concave down. So here's an example of what that might look like near A. How about if the first derivative is negative, but the second derivative is positive at A? Well. Now, if the first derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. If the second derivative is positive, the function is concave up. So our function might look something like this. And then the last scenario is if both derivatives are negative. So if the first and second derivative is negative, then the function is decreasing and it is concave down. So this would be an example of what that might look like. So again, none of that is new. That's just kind of... Um, thinking about it from the graphical point of view and understanding given a certain situation for the derivatives. Uh, different way to think about it, same idea though. So if the first derivative is positive, then the curve is rising. So we talked about that on the last slide. If the first derivative is negative, then the curve is falling, increasing or decreasing. Um, if the first derivative is zero or if it does not exist, that's going to be a possible local maximum or minimum. For the second derivative, if the second derivative is positive, the curve is concave up. If the second derivative is negative, the curve is concave down. If the second derivative is zero or does not exist, this is a possible inflection point. Remember, inflection points are where concavity changes. So again, these are all just kind of summaries. So what information does f of x yield about the graph? Well, f of x, what does it tell us? It tells us where things are on the graph. So f of x yields information about where things are on the graph. It's going to give it, at a given x value, it will give us the y value. So it's a location. What information does f prime of x yield about the graph? Well, f prime of x tells us the slope or the instantaneous rate of change uh, which is slope. So it's going to tell us if the function is increasing or decreasing and what does f double prime tell us? f double prime tells us concavity. So is the function concave up or is the function concave down? Okay, so now here we have uh, the relation, or we have the function, which is this blue curve. Uh, we have the derivative, which is the red curve. And we have the second derivative, which is the green curve. 
And so looking at the graphs of f prime and f double prime of x for x close to 10, why does the graph have a relative minimum at x equals 10? So we're focusing on this area. So explain, pause the video, explain why is there a relative minimum there. Unpause when you're ready to check. All right, so what we want to recognize is the function has a relative minimum because the first derivative is 0 at 10 and the second derivative is positive which tells us that it is concave up. And therefore we know from the second derivative test that that means that it is a relative minimum on the function. All right, next four examples. I want you to pause the video and go through. Um, so here you have the solid line is the first derivative. The dashed line is the second derivative. And so you need to come up with a possible graph of the actual function. Uh, so I want you to do this for all four of these graphs. Uh, and then when you finish, unpause and check your work. So again, you are drawing the original function given the first derivative and the second derivative. All right, so the first one here uh, is uh, the solution, sorry, I have here in purple, um, where the key points here I highlighted in blue. So if the uh, second derivative is 0, then the function has an inflection point. So I tried to make this an inflection point. Uh, if the first derivative is 0, then the function has a maximum or minimum. And here the first derivative is 0 again, and the function has a maximum or minimum. If the first derivative is positive, then the function is increasing. If the first derivative is negative, then the function is decreasing. And here the first derivative is positive, so the function is increasing again. Um, so again, there's, uh, you know, the, the general shape, the maximum, minimum, and inflection point are correct. As far as the actual height of those, I don't know. Um, and as far as uh, then some other details or points about the function, I don't know. But the general shape, I know that's correct. Uh, for the next one, same idea. So I drew the original function here in purple and I highlighted the inflection points and the maximums and minimums in blue. Um, so here the first derivative is zero, so I have a relative maximum or minimum. The second derivative is zero, so I have an inflection point. First derivative is zero, so again a ma uh, maximum or minimum. Second derivative is zero, so another inflection point. First derivative is zero, so a maximum or minimum. Again, the uh, my graph is supposed to look symmetrical here. It doesn't look perfect. Um, but you get the general idea. And where the first derivative is positive, the function is increasing. Where the first derivative is negative, the function is decreasing, and so on. So the general shape, the location of the maximums and minimums should be accurate. Uh, for the next one, so here the first derivative is 0, so I have a relative maximum or minimum. Second derivative is 0 here and here, so I have inflection points. And this is what my shape looks like. Now again, here I know that my shape is going to be something like this because um, look at uh, the first derivative. So here it's negative, but it's becoming very, very close to 0. So the function is going to be decreasing, but as the first derivative gets close to zero, the function is going to decrease less and less and less. And so that's how I know that this shape is going to take place as opposed to um, just continuing to go down. So uh, you want to pay attention to those details as well. It's not just about getting the uh, relative maximums and minimums and inflection points correct. Uh, and then the last one here, uh, very similar to number two, I believe it was. Um, so here the first derivative is zero, so I have a relative maximum. First derivative is zero, I have a relative minimum. First derivative is zero, I have a relative minimum. Second derivative is zero here and here, so I have inflection points. And then follow the increasing and decreasing with respect to the first derivative being positive or negative. Good stuff. Okay. Moving on to infinite limits. So this is not new. So I want you to pause the video and evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity of this function. Unpause when you're ready to check your work. 
All right, so we should get an answer of 10. So the limit as x goes to infinity of this function is 10. Now, how do I come up with that if you don't remember? Well, first, uh, remember when you're evaluating limits to infinity or negative infinity, you want to think in terms of end behavior. Uh, and so a lot of times that's going to be horizontal or oblique asymptotes. So in this case, if I look at this first piece individually, it has a horizontal asymptote at negative 5 thirds. So I know the limit as x goes to infinity of this function, or of this, yeah, of this function would be negative 5 thirds. Here, this is also a rational function. If I rewrite it as negative 8 plus 3x over x, I can see that it has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 3. So the limit as x goes to infinity of this function would be 3. Uh, this is not a rational function, but the first piece here is exponential decay. So this would be 1 over 7 to the x. So as x goes to infinity for that, that's going to go to 0. Because if, as for exponential decay, think about what happens as x grows. Uh, you know, exponential decay is where a function looks like this. So as x grows, y is going to approach 0. And then uh, the limit as x goes to infinity of negative 2 is just negative 2. So I end up with negative 5 thirds times 3 times 0 minus 2, which is just 10. Next one. Evaluate the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 3x minus 2 over the square root of 2x squared plus 1. Pause the video, unpause when you're ready to check your work. Alright, so we should end up with negative 3 root 2 over 2. So if you don't remember, this is how we do these problems. So uh, I have to define x in terms of the square root of x squared, uh, because those are equivalent. And I need the square root of x squared so that I can um, bring something into the root here. Uh, so what, remember, what we're trying to do is um, create a rational function in the numerator and the denominator. Uh, because we know if the denominator of a uh, fraction is going to go to infinity, then the fraction as a whole will go to zero. Uh, we could have used this technique on the previous problem as well. The previous problem, it's just a little bit easier to think about asymptotes instead. So I'm going to multiply the top by 1 over x and the bottom by negative 1 over square root of x squared. The reason why it's negative is because I'm going to negative infinity. If this was going to positive infinity, then I would say x equals root x squared. But since it's going to negative infinity, I know x is less than 0, so x is going to be negative root x squared. So, first step then, I end up with 3x minus 2 over x over the negative square root of 2x squared plus 1 over x squared. Uh, separate the fractions. So 3x over x is 3, and then I have minus 2 over x. And so this is what we want to create. Uh, and then in the denominator, um, 2x squared over x squared is 2, and I have plus 1 over x squared. This is all still underneath the root. That's OK. Now I can actually directly evaluate the limit, because 2 over x, as x goes to negative infinity, is going to be 0. It doesn't matter that it's negative infinity. It could be positive infinity. But 2 over infinity is 0. 1 over infinity squared is also 0. So I end up with 3 minus 0 over negative root 2 plus 0. Uh, so I have 3 over negative root 2. Rationalize, I get negative 3 root 2 over 2. Okay, so we want to continue to understand the relationship between a function and its derivative, uh, der or derivatives, both the first and second derivative. And we want to remember how to evaluate limits as x goes to infinity or negative infinity. And remember, basically what we're doing is we're looking for what is the horizontal asymptote or the end behavior.